Hello and welcome to our next virtual bridge session and this time I'm delighted to be joined by Jess McBeef who will be entertaining us. Is entertainment the right Hold word? on, hold yes. on. Entertainment wasn't part of the agreement. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this is really about um, really how, how going forward, if we're going to be living in that virtual space, spending more time with our students online, how exactly we're going to get to oh, a nice safe space um, where we can actually work together. So without further ado, over to you, Jess. OK, so shall I try sharing my screen then and see if we can get my presentation up? I've got a presentation. Is that OK? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. OK. It's OK. Do you see that? Yes. We do. Hey, there we go. Always like to have a little presentation. But hoping you can see me on screen as well. A uh, little, little thumbnail of me. So, um, yeah. So what I'm going to talk about for the next sort of 20 minutes or so is um, really about... So, so there there is to talk about how we're responding to a digital generation. And uh, to start off with, just to explain a little bit about myself uh, and what I do, and uh, and also kind of put that in the context of where we are right now and this idea of moving towards more of that blended learning and more kind of online um, delivery working with students as well. Um, so my name is Jess McBeth. I'm an online safety consultant. Uh, I live in the borders and um, I do all kinds of different work you know training and developing materials and stuff like that but i also work with southwest grid which is um the lead partner in the uk safer internet center so what i'm going to cover uh, this morning is i'm going to talk about um the safe and empowered uh, training program that we have uh, and which is really thinking about uh where uh, young people are at in terms of developing their digital lives and, and how we might want to think about how we um, work with them and, and respond to them in terms of our understanding of, of kind of their use of digital. And then I think there's a bit of a, this idea of putting that in the context of kind of obviously teaching and, and, and working with them. So without further ado, hopefully my little to the next slide there we go so yeah so so southwest grid swgfl is just the lead partner in the uk safer internet center and the the center is a partnership of three charities which you can see listed there so all work together to make the uk uh center there's actually something like 31 centers across europe uh, and the aim of of each of the centers is really all about um supporting and empowering young people to use technology um safely and confidently and have fun online uh, you know, keep them keep them safe at the same time. Um, so, uh, just also as as part of this, obviously the Safe and Empowered program, we have got a session that's next week. I think it is Kenji. I think it's seventeenth. Got a two hour session, um, which is a kind of um, which is going to be a focused session all about the program. So, if you like what you see today, then come along to that. Uh, it's all funded by Education Scotland, so which is why I'm able to provide a lot of this um, completely free. But as you can see on the screen there, uh, when it, when we've got the kind of topics we cover, it's all about bringing those messages up to date um, and kind of thinking about. Um, perhaps some of those preconceived notions we've got around about safety and security online uh, for young people. And of course, very much now we're needing to think about our own as well, because uh, as I was saying the other day, we're all on TV these days, right? We're all, we're all kind of video conferencing. Um, while I'm chatting, if anybody has any questions, let me see, I'm just going to check if I've got the um, chat window up. Don't think I can see the chat for some reason. And uh, two ticks. Hmm. It's it's that. difficult to see while you're presenting your slides, but yeah, I can keep an eye it. on it. Right, fine. You let me know. But also, if anybody just wants to unmute yourself, ask a question, or put your hand up, then please just do that. And I'd rather you know make it as interactive as possible. Um, make sure that I'm giving you what's of interest to you. Um, so, it, it, really, what I'm going to cover today is some some kind of background thinking about digital citizenship. I'm going to start off with this idea of tech where we were. Right. So you can see on screen now some logos that you might recognise. Um, some of you might have been early adopters, right? Might have some Bebo users here, some of the early social media from many years ago. And you'll see um, on the screen some or, some organizations that have flourished, right? And become kind of mammoths, amazing organizations that almost all of us interact with. Some of them have boom and busted. Yeah, remember the Blackberry? <laughs> Um, and so we saw the beginnings of social media. It was, you know, it's still it was quite diverse even ten years ago. Uh, the different kind of aspects we had. We started to see the beginning of anonymous apps, for example. Um, yeah, there was quite a lot going on then. 
But actually, if we kind of fast forward and think about where we are now, um, it's become even so much more diverse. So I, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say I know all of the um, logos that I've got on screen there, but we've seen uh, social media develop. So beyond this idea of just just kind of socialising and, and sharing a photograph for your lunch to the idea of live streaming. Uh, we've seen lots of different apps pop up, things like uh, disappearing images. We've got things like WhatsApp that have kind of moved from, I don't even remember WhatsApp years ago, it was the idea was that you could send an image for free. Does anybody remember that? When it used to cost you money to send a, a, an image by text message. And then WhatsApp came along and said, actually, you can use the internet and send it for free. Uh, but now we kind of think of WhatsApp as a group function. Yeah, so it's about, it's about kind of managing events or chat with or family contacts within a group environment. We've seen the rise of things like online pornography, uh, online shopping so amazon absolutely massive gaming is just seems to have taken over the world right so there's been a huge amount of changes uh, in all of that time but actually when we think about how we engage with young people uh, our online safety messaging has essentially stayed the same so we give lots of messages particularly to younger children about all of the things that they shouldn't do online right so don't share personal information would be uh, an obvious one and yet we're doing that all of the time so i would give an example would be uh, the first day at school photograph or the happy birthday uh, message where you've shared you know child's date of birth etc things like think before you post which seem quite simplistic I'm not sure that all of us do that um, so lots of stuff there even things like um, you know don't meeting up not meeting up with people we know now that so many people are online dating and right now in lockdown you know how are you going to engage um, you know and develop your social life uh, if it's not not doing it online so there's something that's not quite worked there in terms of our messaging in that we have given lots of kind of don't do um, type messages to young people uh, without really supporting them to to develop the skills they really need despite the fact that our technology and how we use it has really changed so that's essentially the kind of background to thinking about um, how we work with young people um, is very much thinking not just what what's the technology that they use now and how are they using it and how can we use it with them but where are we going with it in future as well so you think about um, I'm, I'm here with a, a keyboard and mouse, right? So I'm typing. Um, I, my laptop is a, is, a, is a touch screen, so I can swipe it. I'm wearing my technology on, on my wrist, yeah? I've got a Google Home, I can talk to my tech. I've got virtual reality, so I can be in a different place. So this whole idea of how we engage with technology is gonna move exponentially. So even now, right now, whilst we've jumped on the technology and things like video conferencing, we need to also think ahead about how it's gonna be in, you know, in a year's time, in five years time in 10 years time so both in terms of how we use it as educators but also in terms of the skills that we're supporting young people to develop to make sure that they can get the best out of the technology that they have and I'm particularly mindful that one of the things we've really seen come out of the whole lockdown situation is uh, the, the kind of the widening of the inequalities yeah so we've seen some people that have been able to jump on technology they've got lots of devices in their home they've they already knew how to do loads of stuff and they can just really build on that and then we've got other people that are really really struggling they don't have the technology or they don't have the skills uh, or they don't have a supportive environment to enable them to use it um, in the way that's going to be that's going to work uh, and help them kind of build and grow uh, on all of that so Digital citizenship is is um, is the, the kind of my kind of background to all of this, and essentially the, the two pictures that I've got on screen there are um, are about trying to recognise that we've been giving mixed messages to young people about technology. So on on the left hand side there, we've got a photograph of two ladies working with a computer, uh, and that is supposed to represent uh, the whole digital skills agenda. So it's about broadband and it's about uh, getting jobs. It's about the economy. Yeah, it's about tech being kind of awesome and cool and amazing and rad. Uh, so we've got all of that wonderful stuff going on. And then on the other hand, we've got the other photograph there, which is the, the online safety messaging, which, um, you know, terrible things do happen to people online and they do happen to vulnerable people, including children online. So I, I'm not suggesting that isn't the case, uh, but it feels like the messaging is quite stuck back there. So digital citizenship is about bringing those two together and saying, actually, we really need to transform. Uh, and it's very much about recognizing that we might come to the party with certain perspectives on things that we might be scaring young people around about technology or scaring ourselves and, and feeling unconfident with technology. Uh, and actually, we need to just kind of jump, jump right in there.
the four bullet points I've got that are really just this idea of what's different about being online because digital is different. Yeah, it's, it's not just another place. It's a fundamentally different environment for us to operate in. And that's why we see some weird stuff going on online. So we were talking about Zoom bombing earlier. That's a great example of a kind of risk and issue that we hadn't really anticipated because we're operating in a different environment in terms of our communications. So just to summarize all of that, I think that we're on a journey in terms of how we support young people and ourselves online. And the journey is from the e-safety, which is that, that kind of middle column there, towards this idea of digital citizenship. And probably the most important, the, the most fundamental line in there is that second one down about the assumption. I think that our traditional approach with online safety has been to assume that we don't need to be online, or particularly that, that young people, children and young people don't need to be online. So if there's a risk, of being online then why be online we take everything away so that's the kind of shut down remove you know turn off the the wi-fi at night all that that's that whole kind of background to that and i think we're moving towards this idea that internet use is essential actually and if it's essential then rather than having a controlling perspective uh, it needs to be more of an empowering perspective uh, for young people and for ourselves this is just from Education Scotland and it's just, you know, they're, they're really into the whole kind of empowerment approach. And so it's just to say that a lot of what I'm doing is trying to fit in with that and recognise that we all need to be empowered online. And this is not just about children and young people uh, and our students, uh, but it's also about kind of families that we work with and, and kind of staff and ourselves um, as well. So what are the implications of all of that? Um, this is just to, to, to this slide's really just to, to show obviously all the different kind of risk aspects that there are online and all the different aspects that being online um, can affect for ourselves and for young people. Uh, the reputation one is really interesting because in my sessions I look at professional reputation uh, and I've been doing quite a lot of extra work at the moment, which is all about how do we um, manage our private you know our private selves online versus our professional selves online so again when we're looking particularly in terms of engaging with young people uh how can we do that can we maintain that separation you know me I, there's me in my kind of personal life on facebook and then there's me in terms of delivering online there's me representing a uh, college or the organization that i work for and and those things all getting quite blurred uh, and producing some risk in there but also i think some some really big questions for us i know you had another um speaker on one of your sessions talking about authenticity online you know so can you be yourself online um how does all of that work? How do we manage privacy? So that's a really big area for me. Uh, and you can see the other ones on there as well. So there's obviously lots of implications in terms of how we work with young people in terms of these specific um, areas. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an example of one of the things that I, um, I like to look at. So children are digital natives. They know more about tech than grown-ups do. So my question to you, I suppose, is whether you agree with that uh, or neutral or disagree on it. Uh, it'd be great to hear from anybody if you want to give your comments on all of this, whether you think children and young people are digital natives or not. Is anybody, is anybody willing to put their hand up and say, I'll have a chat about that? Anyone? Anybody got any problems with it? Anybody think it's amazing? It's absolutely right. It's hit the nail on the head. What do we think? Um, I'll, I'll say something about it. I yeah, think, go for it. Yeah. Um, I don't agree that they are digital natives. I think, yes, they're growing up with the technology, but I think, like everyone, you have to learn how to use it. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, um, I mean, there are stuff that there are things that my daughter will know that I don't know what to do, but equally, there's a lot of stuff that I'll have to teach her as well. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think they're they're digital. Yeah. So that's probably the first thing that we think of, right, is that actually, yeah, they know some stuff, but they don't know it all. So uh, in my own example, uh, so I've got, I've got, you know, children at school and through homeschooling, what I've discovered is that actually they don't even know some simple things like how to open Word, <laughs> right? So it's this idea of a young person might know how to send a snap in Snapchat, but they don't know how to operate some of the basic tools online. So that's absolutely one of, one of the kind of fundamental elements, that there's something there that, that we need to teach those skills. There's also, I think, another aspect to it, which is this idea idea that um, there's some really fundamental things about how we operate online and you will start to see this as you're doing more and more delivery online with young people is some of those fundamentals so for example uh, how do you disagree with somebody online without it you know without it turning into a flaming war yeah 
How do you make good choice about who you follow online? Who's going to be a good influence on you and who isn't? How do you cope with inappropriate content online? What, what are you going to do about that? Uh, certainly when I talk to young people, quite a lot of them just say they're going to ignore things and hope that they go away. So there's this whole idea of those kind of underlying, what you might almost call those meta skills around about how we engage um, using technology uh, to communicate and some of the difficulties that technology um, kind of puts into the mix, into the mix there that affect uh, our, our method of communication. One of the big problems I think with the digital native idea is that it's very much putting down my own confidence. So it's what it's saying, it's kind of putting young people on a pedestal and saying, well, they know it all, right? They know how to do all of this stuff and I don't know anything. So, um, so I won't attempt to teach them anything because they know more already, they know already, so I don't need to do that. Uh, and actually, maybe I won't ask them that question about something because I'll look like I'm really stupid if I do ask it. Yeah. So I think there's a really big thing for particularly for educators about recognizing that actually we're never going to know it all. So young people will always be one step ahead of us. And actually, when we do all jump into Snapchat or TikTok or whatever it is, they're going to go and move somewhere else because they don't really want us in their space anyway. I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had there about this idea of going to where young people are so that we can communicate with them. Sometimes they don't want us there. Right? <laughs> um, so, so this whole idea of, of confidence. And again, I'm sure that you'll have lots of colleagues that are feeling quite anxious and, you know, and nervous about using technology in terms of teaching and learning and supporting young people. Uh, and so it's how can we help them to move on from some of these narratives that might be having that, that impact on them. The other aspect to think about, uh, so beyond the kind of, you know, the technicalities of, of, um, of kind of some of the risks and issues that they have in our own confidence, I think there are some, some practical implications of all of, of all of the things that I've, I've talked about. So, for example, if you look at curriculum, um, I do think there's an aspect uh, that we've quite often put tech to one side, haven't we? You know, we, we've quite often treated it as a kind of add on or, or a separate subject or something else to be looked at. Um, it's either sat within the kind of computing type stuff or it's maybe sat within the kind of health and well-being and, and kind of um, supportive stuff. Uh, but actually, if we think about those meta skills, then it needs to cut right across. And I think we are very much seeing a lot of that within the college sector of recognising that actually we need to build this right across the whole curriculum. So there are some practical um, aspects there. There's also, if we look at vulnerability online, again, I know I mentioned this earlier, but vulnerable there is research that shows that vulnerable young people will take those vulnerabilities into the online space, right? So we will find that there are some young people that we work with that are experiencing quite a lot of issues online compared to others. So again, how we, um, there's, there's an element of almost risk assessment or kind of being mindful of who you are working with and what kind of um, strengths, but also vulnerabilities they might bring with them if you're working with them online and how that might play out. So kind of being mindful to all of that and what kind of support we might um, offer to them. Um, and, and the bottom one I've got there, outcomes, is, is of course this whole idea about the digital transformation that's going on. So uh, how we're all using tech. So again, we've seen this hugely in terms of jumping into the kind of video conferencing and thinking longer term. So we kind of made the initial we made the initial move to like, let's jump on the tech so we can at least continue delivering some stuff, right? Even if it's just sending out a bit of information. Um, but behind that starts to come, actually, what are the transformational changes that are going to go on here? Um, and all of the issues that we're going to have societally as a result of the lockdown, for example, where does technology kind of play into supporting some of that? The final thing I wanted to mention was just very briefly, of course, about online delivery so and again you know there'll be lots of work looking at all of this but if I kind of zoom in here we did that initial thing which was about jumping on a platform so again the conversation we had at the beginning we were talking about zoom and teams and all the issues around about all of that um, and I feel that there was a sense of us being in an, an immediate problem uh, you know a short-term issue going into lockdown that we needed to you know jump on a platform that worked uh, and, and and that was you know we did we did what we needed to do but actually there are some bigger things that we need to think about when we are choosing uh, a platform. So for any of you that are involved in any of that, and, and I'm aware that there are some major platforms that will already have been made a decision on. So, you know, this, this may not be relevant to you, but some of the things um, to think about in terms of 
uh, a platform. Clearly are things like terms and conditions. So sometimes we are missing the fact that perhaps a certain platform is only for personal use. It's not actually set up to be for, for business use, or it might have a minimum age of 16 and that might have um, some impact for us. We obviously are aware of privacy issues, but for example, if you look at Zoom, you know, it's harvesting certain data about how we are, how we are engaging the platform and other information to sell it to advertisers. So are we happy with that? Um, security issues we've already talked about, you know, Zoom bombing and all that kind of stuff. And then at the bottom there, what support is available? So making sure that we understand if whatever platform we're using, we, we are aware of how you report an issue and what kind of support that you can get in it. So that's the kind of, some of the issues I've seen around about choice of platform that I think we haven't quite um, teased out yet. Uh, the other thing I'll just pick up on more generally, this is obviously because I come from a kind of safeguarding perspective, um, is yeah, there's safeguarding. I, I mean, I was chatting with somebody yesterday who was, we were talking about having policy for staff, you know, so kind of etiquette online, right? You know, don't be sitting in bed wearing your pajamas, right? Um, but whether there was etiquette for any kind of policies around for, for young people, stuff that could be sent out about what is appropriate behavior online. And again, I think we need to remember that sometimes young people are not they haven't fully thought through uh, the differences here about what they need to do online uh, differently from kind of face to face. So that whole kind of staff and student etiquette, as well as all the things around about, you know, as somebody who's delivering, if you are in a video conference with somebody, you know, being mindful of what you might see or hear in the background, um, you know, and all those kind of safeguarding elements to it as well. Updating policy is another one as well. So you just have a wee think about things like your acceptable use policy, um, even things like your insurance again I don't know much about kind of what insurance applies in the college sector but recognizing that if you're delivering online this is this is a completely new you know potentially completely new format of delivery and whether you are covered for all of that and have reflected it in all of the policies that you have in terms of uh, back to the idea of using a um whichever platform you use, we do need to think about getting informed consent. So whether that's from a student or it might be from you know, a parent or carer, depending on the age of the student, we do need to be mindful that we are explaining which platform we want to use um, what the issues are with that and not in, you know, not in pages and pages of terms and conditions, but what the issues are and making sure that they've actually given their informed consent for using that platform, but also think about what if they don't give their consent. So you know, how are we going to ensure that we provide a service to all and accessibility, of course, um, forms part of that as well. How are we going to ensure particularly for vulnerable students or particular needs to ensure that they are able to to engage just as much as they would uh, in an, any other mechanism? And that, so that's kind of it, really. The only other thing I quickly wanted to mention was just about the resources, it's a couple of resources that may be of use to you. Again, these are from an online safety perspective. Uh, the one on the left is reportharmfulcontent.com, which is a really helpful uh, website, so bookmark it if you can. And it's a, a resource to help you if you have tried reporting something to an online platform, something that you're not happy with, and they haven't taken it down. This is when you can come to report harmful content. They don't deal with illegal content, they deal with harmful but legal stuff so if it's illegal obviously go to the police or fraud or whatever uh, it's it's the other kind of topics that you can see on screen there if you've reported them but having difficulty getting them taken down from facebook or instagram or xbox or whatever it is you can come to report harmful content the final one to mention is the professionals online safety helpline uh, which is a helpline for anybody that works with uh, young people and you can contact them uh, about an issue affecting a young person yourself or your organization so again they've kind of seen and heard it all uh, and that, that's kind of it really that's my that's my very very quick run through of lots of different things uh, to think about uh, in terms of how we engage uh, with young people so I haven't I really had any questions so feel free to, to fire in with your questions I'm aware it's, it's 25 past according to my computer clock um, um, we'd love to have a chat there have been a few questions in oh, chat there? okay um, great a wall I'm going to call him Alan because uh, I seem to remember this from yesterday Alan you might want to unmute yourself and ask the question or, or raise the point Stop yourself. Sharing. There we go. Oh, yeah, I, you're, I can't hear you because you're muted. I'm unmuting you just now. So hopefully. Oh, is, yep. is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my, I commented about accessibility and, you know, particularly older learners and that, you know, I work with dyslexia and a range of specific learning difficulties. Um, particularly older learners are struggling, although they may have the assisted technology. I think that they're overwhelmed. And my concern is that there, there's, you know, if they're relying on peer support, um, you know, rather than coming to us sometimes. I don't know, it's just how, it's how you deal with all that um, and give them the tools to have the confidence. 
Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. And this, this is the big issue we've got, right, is that people, is because we're not actually doing that kind of face-to-face -face engagement and we don't necessarily understand all of the support networks that are around somebody as to what, you know, what they've got available to help them engage online. I think this whole idea of vulnerabilities online is really interesting. Um, and some research that I've seen, you know, looks at kind of, really this idea of what are, what are young people looking to to get online what's their motivation for some of the activities that they undertake online uh, and sometimes i feel that some of the safeguarding side of stuff that we do is a bit too black and white you know it's a bit don't do this yeah mm -hmm. uh, not really actually having the, the kind of depth of conversation that you might need with a young person about you know what support they need what they're looking to get from online because of course young people as you know we were all young people looking for all kinds of stuff online validation and kind of connection and communication and all this kind of stuff uh, and i think you know you're absolutely right that quite often we provide the tech solution to something and actually what it needs is, is a bit more than that that'll be my suggestion but i'd love to hear from comments from anybody else and, and jess just to just to expand on what alan has said um, obviously, you, you work a lot with the younger people. Yeah. Do you think that some of the points that you raised in your presentation equally apply to, to other generations or older generations? Because colleges and universities, to an extent, work with a, a, a mixed, a wide range of age groups. Yeah, absolutely. So what we are seeing now, I think, is a move, a, a kind of recognition within the online safety community that this isn't just about children and young people, that we're all we're all at risk online. Right. So we've all got issues. Just take something like media literacy, you know, the fake news, uh, the impact that we've had, uh, both in terms of uh, conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff that's affecting adults, as well as the pivot of fraudulent activity towards uh, coronavirus type scams. So there's lots of issues affecting um, adults online. And then again, you know, you add the layer onto that, which is about vulnerable adults too. So in a very simple sense, you might say, for example, if you, um, if you provided advice to somebody to, to, to access online and they didn't have a device yet, great thing to do they can access lots of wonderful resources learning etc through technology but perhaps that person's also going to take a vulnerability with them online so for example if you've got somebody who has a problem with gambling and you provide them a device that allows them access to the internet now suddenly they're gambling online so you kind of need to you know there is very much a, a wider sense of we all have vulnerabilities online uh, and there's an element of kind of recognizing how we can use technology in a healthy way yeah healthy and positive way does anyone else have any questions, especially related to how you might be working with students um, post the, the, the summer break or, or issues you might be thinking about? Oh, stunned by the silence here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gosh. Do, Jess, do you, do you have like, if, if I'm going to start um, designing online for online delivery after the summer and I'm going to be starting to work with new cohorts of new students coming into the college or university. Are there any tips that you could give me about things I should be thinking about when I'm getting my students to collaborate more online? Because I, I definitely know now that we're losing that kind of social capital of have people coming onto the campus, making friends and talking to each other. We, we do want people to talk to each other. So as we're encouraging students to collaborate more online, is there any notion of safety, any notion of advice that we should be passing along to them as, as they form these groups, sometimes within college and university mandated platforms, sometimes outside using third party platforms? Yeah, so I think very much, again, it's going to depend on the young people that you're working with. And clearly, you might not know much about them to start off with. So there is... Um, there's this idea of kind of starting off as you mean to go on right so i think we do need to have a lot of clarity at the beginning uh, and that might be through you kind of got email engagement or whatever in terms of them understanding how things work but certainly your kind of initial session with young people is about setting the groundwork the ground rules about how things work one of the things that we find when we go online is this idea of the what they call the toxic disinhibition effect we do stuff online that we would not do face to face <laughs> for a variety of reasons some of which is to do with the distance so we say something to somebody online and we don't necessarily see their immediate response 
so we, we will do if it's a video conference but if it's any other format we don't see the effect that we're having on them even things like lack of eye contact uh, mean that we can kind of reduce that human aspect and also the fact that we are we are channeling all of our um, communication through technology means that we're missing a lot of the kind of nuance we don't necessarily see body language all of this kind of stuff so this has to be more time spent at the beginning with young people helping them to understand what's going to be appropriate and inappropriate behavior and how things work so that that's probably the first thing um, that I would mention. The other thing, of course, again, is that young people are looking to socialize. You, you know that right now they're missing that element of socializing. So they will find lots of interesting and devious ways to socialize using the technology if they can. Right. So any kind of share any any mechanism that you use that allows shared content, you may well see deluged. So there's an aspect of providing some sort of space. So depending on the platform you've got, whether that's another channel or whether it's a separate session that you have that's just for socializing or whatever you are meeting those needs so again when we talked about what the motivation is and the needs for young people online you're looking at other ways that they can deliver that as well uh, obviously you do need to have very clear processes about what you're going to do what your sanctions are going to be or how you are going to react when things don't go well right so when somebody does share something inappropriate or says something inappropriate or leave somebody out deliberately or whatever it is you need to be very clear about how things are reported to you and and, and what what, what um, steps you're going to take about all of that so that would be some sort of initial um, things that I would suggest in terms of starting but I come back again and again and again to the vulnerability of students you may well be the own you know you may well be the eyes and ears into uh, a young person's life uh, and, and there might be all kind of stuff that come that comes out that you weren't necessarily expecting so just be be prepared <laughs> John, yep. are you, are yep. you, you yeah, able I, to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. I, the, I'm interested, Jess, in the platforms that I'm using. I've been doing a bit of work with a few colleges that are doing school college work. Uh -huh. um, one of the notable differences is the local authorities um, are quite often having differential rules about what platforms you can use. And quite often, the one that strikes me is a, a couple of them have banned the use of Zoom because they believe there's an issue with Zoom bombing. I don't know if there still is an issue, but the rationale for that seems to have been around anecdote rather than, you know, evidence. I don't know if it's still the same with the um, passwords and things that they use. But I wondered if there's any mechanism or list that highlights particular risks or safety elements around Teams or Google Classroom or Zoom or, or other platforms. Because I think that there's a level of decision making before the operational stuff that might also contribute to safety but that seems to be based on yeah. some judgment that's never yeah. clear so so my understanding in terms of what's happened at the kind of at the school level the local authority level is of course they already have done quite a lot of work to, to decide and a lot of them had glow and were already on teams and were using that or maybe using google and essentially they'd already done that due diligence to check these platforms out uh, they also set some of the local authorities set them up so for example if you were using teams uh, a young person a child on teams um could join a video conference with their with their teacher but only in audio right so they could see the teacher but you yeah. couldn't see the, the child's video they couldn't set up their own meetings and stuff like that so essentially they've done that background work um if you take something like zoom then i completely agree essentially we've had a you know zoom another organization was set up for businessy purposes it's completely taken off uh and then you know the, the, the on the back foot they start to address these privacy and security issues and try and get it better and better and better um, yeah. and, and I, I completely agree that there's been a little oh my god you know all of this yes there are um sources of information about the different video platforms from different perspectives um should have got my list up with me because there's there's one particularly that i can share and i'll, I'll do that in a minute uh, or at least i'll send it to kenji afterwards um again so there's, there's i'll probably said share two or different two or three different links. There's no, in my perspective, and again, I haven't spent an awful lot of time looking at all of the, the kind of uh, the way these platforms work, again, because they're changing all the time, Zoom in particular. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's one platform that magically does everything you want to do is completely safe. Because even if you looked at something like Zoom and you've got everything locked down, it's all password protected, you still get the potential for hacking, right? So <laughs> none of these things are completely safe. Uh, yeah, it is problematic that some of, in my perspective, that some of them have said you can't use Zoom because Zoom has got lots of great stuff. But it does, on the other hand, you know, harvest a lot of, a lot of data and it's supposed to be 16 plus. So, you know. So, um, and, and you should probably just take advice from your local institution as to, to yes, the systems that yes, they manage. they may but, well have um, done a lot of that due diligence already. We're mm -hmm. slightly over time, but I'm going to squeeze in one last question from uh, Frank, which I think was extremely relevant and will 
we'll close the recording after that. So Frank, can you unmute yourself and possibly pose sure. your question? Thanks. Thanks, thanks Kenji. Um, this is completely by coincidence, but I started to read this book last night and I'm not advocating it. I've already read the introduction and a bit of the first chapter. It's called The Quiet Education by a chap called Jamie Tom. Now, as I say, I don't know if it's a good book or not, but it's already raised some pertinent questions, I think, as to how we support introverted students. Because the book talks about how students are evaluated in school uh, conventionally by their level of interaction with the class. Um, even in, in, in parents' nights, teachers will always comment on how frequently the student interacts, raises their hand and answers questions. I think in this environment with this, these new technologies, introverted students will feel even more pressure if they see a picture of themselves on the screen talking like we are just now. A lot of these students will struggle with that. And it's a genuine question. How do we support these types of students? I don't, uh, there'll be somebody else that's better able to respond to that. The only thing I would say is I think that we are going through a transition period. So just as we've been talking about the reluctance to use some of these and how it's, how's it going to work and all of the issues, I think we'll kind of work through that and it'll start to become much more the norm. That would be, but th that doesn't necessarily answer your question right now. Sure. Okay, um, that's all that we really have time for for this recorded segment. So for those of you watching this online, I do hope you have the opportunity to join us um, for a live session at some future date. But until then, um, and, and you may, as Irene uh, and Joy have said in the chat, maybe this will become mandatory training for everyone in colleges and universities, as they hope it will be. But until then, uh, I hope you stay safe and we see you at some future virtual bridge session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.